Good afternoon. I'm Tamiko Brown Nagan, Dean of the Harvard Radcliffe Institute. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our annual Kim and Judy Davis Dean's Lecture in the Humanities. Before we begin, I want to thank Kim and Judy Davis, whose support makes this lecture series possible. I'd also like to acknowledge the members of the Radcliffe Institute Leadership Society and all our annual donors. Your generosity ensures that our events are free and open to the public, and we thank you. We're also grateful to NDR Radio Philharmony for their kind support of our live stream with today's distinguished speaker, Midori. Midori is an internationally acclaimed violinist, activist, and educator. She's lauded for her precise and expressive performances and has collaborated with a staggering range of world-renowned musicians and ensembles. She's also the recipient of numerous awards, including last year's Kennedy Center Honors in recognition of her contributions to American culture. President John F. Kennedy, the namesake of the Kennedy Center, famously extol the ability of the arts to, quote, remind man of the universality of his feelings and desires and despairs. In other contexts, he described artists in individual terms, praising the rare artistic genius at odds with society, calling out injustice and defying convention. This points to an intriguing dichotomy in our popular conceptions of the arts as a reflection of a universal human condition and the artist as a rarefied solitary being. But in both characterizations, the arts are linked to the humanistic endeavor to grapple with complex questions in pursuits of deeper understanding. Our guest today once described music as a poetry and song that can be found in our hearts, that can be released, externalized, and shared with others. Perhaps as this quality, that allows music to serve so powerfully as a mode of individual expression and as a means of connection, helping us to understand ourselves and one another. Midori's career is grounded in her conviction that music can bring people together. She has worked for decades to advance humanitarian and educational programs and serves as a United Nations messenger of peace. She's the founder of several nonprofit organizations, including Midori and Friends, which runs music programs for youth and communities in New York City, and Music Sharing, which brings Japanese and Western classical music traditions to young people throughout Asia. She's also the founder of Partners in Performance and of the Orchestra Residencies Program. In addition to her achievements as a performer and her humanitarian work, Modori is the Dorothy Richard Starling Chair in Violin Studies at the Curtis Institute of Music in Philadelphia and a distinguished visiting artist at the Peabody Institute of the Johns Hopkins University. We're honored to have her with us this afternoon. Following her remarks, Modori will be joined in conversation by Michael Reed. Michael was assistant dean of Harvard College, the Alston Burr resident dean of Dunster House, and lecturer and associate director of undergraduate studies in Harvard's Department of Music. His research examines subjects including philanthropy, arts education, and cultural policy. And he's the author of Ask the Experts, How Ford, Rockefeller, and the NEA Changed American Music. Thank you, Michael, for joining us. Now some logistics. Following Midori and Michael's discussion, we'll turn to audience questions. You can use the Q&A feature on Zoom to submit your questions at any point during the program. We only ask that you keep your questions brief so we can address as many of them as possible. With that, I'm pleased to give the virtual floor to Midori. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here with you, although, this is really the gift of technology that I'm physically not in the US right now, but in Hanover, Germany. And I'm so happy to be able to talk to you today about 
my passionate um, community engagement activities. So I would like to actually um, start with a PowerPoint presentation now to talk about the community engagement programs that I've been so passionate about for the last 30 years. Um, obviously this topic is my passion and I appreciate very much this opportunity to share with you what I have learned from my experiences in the last 30 years. There are two parts of this presentation. First is the overview of my activities. And in the second part, I would like to address some of the more, more common questions that I receive about my work. And then at that time, some photos from the activities will be shared. I want to begin with the start of my journey of becoming involved in the community. This takes me back about three decades. There were three questions I asked myself. What do I want? What do I think is needed? What would I want if I were in another person's shoes? And the answers to these questions set me on the path of my community engagement activities. In 1992, I started Midorian Friends. It was then followed by music sharing, partners in performance, and the orchestra residencies program. Now, in the middle of the slide, you see the UN Sustainable Goals, which I try to promote through all my programs. All my activities stem from my strong belief that music can bring people together. I believe in the power of togetherness to improve and to protect our world. Just to give you a little background, I grew up in the music field as a child performer, and my desire to share my love of music with others kept getting stronger as I made my debuts with different orchestras and had chances to make music with wonderful musicians. I also got to learn from them, not just on stage but off stage about their ideas and interests beyond the stage. In the late 80s and the 90s, I heard older colleagues express concern and frustration about the state of arts education in the US. And that was particularly so in the larger cities. I therefore wanted to become active in trying to reverse the course of diminishing quantity and quality of arts education and with the help and support of supporters, friends, and family, I established my first orientation, Midorian Friends, in New York City. In wanting to share music with others, I saw great potential and opportunities in doing it through education. Midorian Friends brings music education and musical experiences to New York City students in communities through music workshops, instrumental instruction, and performances in partnership with schools and other institutions. During the pandemic, we did not have any in-person activities, but continued to have programs with students through their schools on Zoom and other internet video conferencing platforms. This year, majority of the programs are back in person and only a small percentage is virtual. We have 59 school partnerships so far this year, although that number seems to be growing each month because more schools approach us about programs. We are serving Manhattan, Bronx, Queens, and Brooklyn. Over 10,000 students are served through our three program areas, Play to Learn, which is our instrumental instruction, Celebrate Music, that is World Music Concert Series and Curriculum, and Next Gen Teen Musicians, which is a mentorship program. Music Sharing is an organization based in Tokyo whose work started somewhat similar to that of Midori and Friends, but grew to respond to the particular needs of the systems and culture in Japan and Asia. There are three main programs, the visiting program, the instrumental program for the disabled and the international community engagement program. The visiting program focuses on bringing high quality performance and opportunities by professional musicians to schools, nursing homes, 
and hospitals. In the visiting program, both Western classical music and Japanese traditional music are presented. In the instrumental program for the disabled, teaching artists visit our partner special education schools on a weekly basis to teach students with disabilities to make music with an orchestral instrument such as a violin, flute, and saxophone. We currently have eight partner schools with about 500 students participating. And ICEP, that's the International Community Engagement Program, is a multifaceted program in which I go to a developing region in Asia, such as Cambodia, India, Vietnam, Myanmar, and Laos. Coming along with me are four young people, three musicians and an administrative intern who all apply to participate in this program. They are selected based on their artistic and administrative capabilities, interests, and eagerness to connect and to learn. In addition to playing chamber music, the young musicians experience different cultures, learn about methods of musical outreach, and test their presentation skills. Together, we learn about community engagement technique and explore the meaning of music for each of us. The following year, with the same set of musicians, I visit schools and institutions in Japan through our visiting program. The priority is always on engaging with people who might otherwise not have a chance to experience the performing arts or who may have extremely limited contact with the outside world. Due to the pandemic, music sharing unfortunately is only able to have online programs right now, which have been created to reach school children and other groups whom we normally are working with through the visiting programs. We are providing online programs to about 130 institutions and schools, reaching about a total of 30,000 residents, patients, and students. We do hope very much that the next planned period of activities in June can take place in person. My third nonprofit organization is Partners in Performance, PIP for short. We co-present chamber music concerts in smaller communities in the United States outside the radius and without the financial resources of major urban centers with the goal of stimulating interest in classical music. It's important for me to mention that PIP is the only one of my three nonprofits that works to support solely classical music. We offer two performances over a two year period one by me with a collaborative pianist and the second by a young and upcoming artist. These performances are complemented by educational outreach work. And last but not least is the Orchestra Residencies Program, or for short. The aim of this project, which is for youth orchestras, is to engage young musicians of the youth orchestras in active musical collaboration in normal times, that's before the pandemic and hopefully after the pandemic, I visit a youth orchestra organization for four to five days during which there are many different activities planned. We make music together, rehearse, practice together, perform together, learn from one another through workshops, talks, and master classes. And we also try to attract the attention of the surrounding community, government, and potential sources of arts funding. During much of the COVID period, I was unable to travel, but still wanted to connect with the youth orchestra musicians. So I offered a selection of activities like workshops on how to practice, masterclasses, and presentations for parents and local teachers, all online. Our next ORP is scheduled for this spring in Florida, and I'm crossing my fingers that it will be able to take place in person, COVID permitting. Through all my activities and projects, I support the 17 sustainable goals of the UN. These goals are to raise the quality of life for all people and envision a safer, healthier, justified, meaningful, and participatory ways of living for all. It also supports empowering people to be responsible for their own communities. By sharing music, by playing and engaging others, 
as well as bringing awareness to issues, situations, and circumstances that halt and hinder progress. I hope to increase the sense of calling for all of us to work together towards achieving these goals. I take opportunities to see, to communicate, and to share with diverse communities at, at and closer to home and in other parts of the world. So these are my main activities besides giving performances and teaching in a music conservatory. So now going into the second part, um, I like to say that since the time I first became involved in community engagement, my life has been enriched for the experiences I have received. I cannot imagine my life, both professional and personal, without these programs and projects. Now, I'd like to share with you five of the most common questions I'm asked, and I will try to answer them. What initially inspired me to start my activities? What I learned from my activities? What surprised me as I am working with these programs? And at the end, I'd like to include some tips and hints for those wishing to become involved in charitable work. So now going into trying to answer some of the questions. First question, which was, what inspired me to start? I think it started in a very natural way. I had a dream of connecting people through music. I became aware of the need. In this case, it was a lack of arts education in New York City public schools. And I considered how I could support it. These ideas led to the founding of my first organization, Midori in Friends. It started with a seemingly a very simple idea. Of course, I wanted to share music myself, but it was also very important to have a structure in which I could, um, so I could get support of my colleagues so that they can also share. And in bringing people together and having the system, it was necessary to start me doing friends. I was also greatly influenced and inspired by people close to me, including family members and friends who have committed themselves to sharing their skills with their communities. I had an urge to be involved in my community, a passion to share my skills. It was a calling and I had to do it. It became my mission to continue and to lead in this mission. And as I continue, I have developed a strong sense of service. The next question is, what have I learned from activities? I've learned so much that I feel like I can write at least five books of all the things that I've experienced. Um, one of the most important things that I learned, I think, is that there is no such a thing as truth with a capital T. My truth is simply my opinion. My perspective as I am, sub I am, I am a subjective being. And this means that others may not agree with me and I may not agree with others. This all made me learn to become very tolerant. I have also learned about the power of one, where one person can inspire a movement of change. What can one person do? One is a very powerful entity. Zero cannot multiply while one can. I want to do so much more. And while I may be limited if I work alone, I can achieve so much more if I work collaboratively with others. It's important to remember that one can multiply. Whether you are the one or the multiplier, the result is that whatever it is you want to achieve has a chance to grow. But nothing happens until that one is gained. Well, what I have talked about so far was a description of the organizations and activities that I do. They sound like a series of achievements, but I think the important lesson that I've gained through these experiences is a feeling of helplessness and powerlessness. They force me to confront and accept my shortcomings and they have motivated me to better myself. In the process of all these activities, I have also learned 
that I can't change the world. Music can't change the world, but it can help make this world a better place. When I initially started mirroring friends, I thought I would be able to achieve much more, much more quickly. And that I had seen what the problem was and I could overcome it very, very quickly. But I have learned that problems change, they deepen, they ease, and then new problems, new challenges arise. I've learned that it's important to always keep my eyes and ears open for changes around me to guide my actions. What I should do and what I would like to do, and if I can't do it, how can I make it possible? Going on to the next question, what surprised me? I think that I was not prepared for the extent of the poverty I encountered through ISEP in particular. There is an extreme degree of marginalization of certain communities, injustices originating from fear, power play, stupidity, lack of compassion, and greed. I've also seen aftermath of violence, both physical and psychological, not just in developing regions, but also right in my own backyard at home in the US. There are many types of poverty and of marginalization. And with ISEP, I have traveled to remote villages, restric restricted areas, refugee camps, and towns where there may not be paved roads or easy access to clean water. Remote communities that are not included in the government census, nor will they ever be on a map because, believe it or not, these communities today, they're still being ignored and being marginalized, not because they're small in size, but society gets away by not acknowledging them. And this comes of severe prejudice. I also see and meet many very ill patients, their families, sometimes when they have them, as well as their friends. Some of these ill patients are just hours away from dying or they have congenital diseases and conditions and may never have left the room they're in for the last 15 or 20 years, or those who are strapped to their beds for their own safety as well as for the safety of others. I meet those who have never breathed on their own or those who have been cut off from their families because of misinformation or purposely withheld correct medical knowledge. My ISIP colleagues, for example, and I go from room to room, bedside to bedside, person to person, sharing music, playing so that they can hear sounds filled with human warmth. Live musical sounds is effective and is filled with emotions to which people respond in their own possible ways. What music can do is varied and unrestricted. It can be a stimulus. It can be something from the outside world, a sound of hope, of interest, of care and acknowledgement. And experiencing all these things, I am inspired. Now the last question, if I may, what are my suggestions for those wishing to become more involved in their communities? I think that we can start to explore our own communities by looking at local organizations and learning about their missions. We can also research local businesses and see how involved they are in their communities and what organizations and causes they're supporting. We can look for volunteer opportunities, but the best way to start learning is by doing. Today, there are many nonprofit organizations doing great work, many more than when I started my first organization in 1992. Corporations and businesses are much more eager now than ever to be involved in their communities. It's not always necessary to start a nonprofit in order to make a contribution to society. The key is to collaborate. If there is a desire to lead, there are possibilities in serving. And in serving, we can play a role in building and sh shaping a better future. So at this point, I'd like to ask Professor Michael Wee to join 
and to um, have a short conversation. Thank you so very much, Midori, for this very thought-provoking presentation. Um, I consider it a great honor to be able to speak with you uh, in our remaining time. And thank you also to the uh, Radcliffe Institute for this opportunity that we have. So Midori, if you don't mind, I've got a few questions and I'll be taking some questions from the audience. So uh, if you're tuning in, then feel free to use that Q&A function and we will try and incorporate as many questions as possible. Midori, I'm wondering to begin with, how do you find the time to balance being both a professional concert artist, um, an educator, a professor yourself, as well as uh, manage and oversee lead for nonprofit organizations? Um, how do you find the time to, to do all those things? It's a very good question that you're asking. Um, yes, I am engaged in many, many things, and it's also the way I like it. And I also have a lot of support. Um, of course, practicing, I can't actually ask somebody else to practice on my behalf. Mm -hmm. um, but um, there are things that I can delegate there. Um, there's much support that I can get. Um, and I really do enjoy working with others. My mother is a great, great, great help always. Um, mm -hmm. She's a great help for everything except for practicing. You know, <laughs> again, practicing is something only I can do. But also, since I started to perform. Uh, I was quite young uh, when I started to embark on this career. And of course, it was not as extensive as it is today, but I was able to gradually get into this career. And because I was able to balance school, um, hmm. I went to a regular school. I was not homeschooled. Um, and trying to figure out how to, my, how to manage my time in between concerts, um, also going to school and practicing. Um, this was a great way to learn how, first of all, to schedule my day, how mm -hmm. to organize, and not to just organize today, tomorrow, this week, but to be thinking three months, five months, six months from now, next year, what am I going to be doing? What do I need to be prepared for? Um, and also learning what kind of buffer that I need to have in my schedule, how to create that buffer and how to remember to create that buffer, how much time I need for that buffer. Um, just by uh, trial and error um, that I learned these things. Um, and so I feel like my life is very well organized in that mm -hmm. sense. Um, I manage time well. And the other thing um, is that I can sleep anywhere. I can sleep um, just in the course of two seconds, I could be asleep. And I'm great at taking cat naps. So I can charge myself. Um, I could just take a little bit of a cat nap and under the piano, actually, when my piano is actually just warming up, I'll take a cover of the piano, put it under the piano, and then just lie down and sleep. Um, or I get on the train and I set my alarm. 20 minutes, just a quick nap or an hour, or an hour and a half. Um, <laughs> so I'm able to sleep anywhere, which is a great way to recharge myself and to keep my energies up all the time. And I think what's important is that I'm able to switch um, gears very quickly and to be able to concentrate, to focus. Whatever that task is at that moment, um, it usually happens um, quite smoothly. Mm. <laughs> Those are wonderful stories about how you're able to sleep anywhere, but good lessons in uh, making sure that we get sleep, that we take care of ourselves, uh, and that we have the ability to, to switch um, and focus on whatever task that we have at hand, uh, hopefully with some planning and organization to it. Uh, Midori, I'm wondering, in what ways has your work in these other areas, in, in nonprofit organizations, in service, also maybe had an impact in the way that you perform or interpret music or find meaning in music? Is that something that you found over the, the years or, or, or maybe not? I think I should have included that um, as part of what I've learned or what surprised me. Um, I didn't go into um, any of these programs thinking that it would be better for my music, um, that I would gain something um, as an interpreter. But of course, I realize that um, I'm getting so much from these experiences. And 
the fact that um, it had really enriched my life. Um, also, to be able to experience these emotions, to be touched, to be moved from these experiences. Um, mm -hmm. um, and it has made me into a much more feeling person. Mm. Uh, much more an emotionally reacting person. Mm. And um, I think that has um, an effect on mm. um, my music. Mm. And I think in terms of um, working in the nonprofits or doing the administrative work, um, it's something that I do enjoy very much. Um, at some point in my life, I did much more of it than mm. I do now. Um, and I, of course, my appreciation for people who are doing it um, has grown. Mm -hmm. um, and I, it's, I think what I appreciate um, is that I was able to learn in a university. I um, didn't go the traditional um, just practice and perform route. Mm -hmm. And I was um, doing actually I majored in psychology and my degrees are in psychology for undergrad and grad. And I think that I really had a wonderful time learning how to do research, how to look for information, mm -hmm. how to actually um, seek support, seek help, and especially um, different ideas, mm -hmm. um, seeing how interdisciplinary um, the world is. Um, I think these things all help me. Um, and just as an administrator, um, to be able to see that there's so many perspectives. Um, and I think it, all these things actually make an effect. Mm -hmm. They just influence you as a person. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, in, in terms of kind of the administrative work and uh, how that is also influenced by maybe how you see um, what, what it means to be a strong leader. Uh, that's something that you've written and spoken about, kind of finding uh, um, leadership opportunities both as, as a volunteer, but also as an administrator. And I'm wondering maybe are there ways that you see uh, strong leaders forming over these years in your organizations? Or, or what does it mean to uh, be a strong leader for an organization? Um, I think that it's, it's a very simple way of putting it. Um, mm. I think to lead means to serve. Mm. Um, those that I have seen, that I have admired as great leaders have always committed themselves to serving. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it just made them so much more than what they were physically doing at any given time and that they were able to offer more, they were able to achieve more, they were able to help and support much more. And um, those, uh, those leaders that I admire so much, um, of course, they're so inspiring because of the ways that they selflessly give and serve. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Midori. Um, Midori, we've, we've had a, a large number of questions come in from the audience. So I'm happy to share some of those. One of those questions relates to um, leadership and service and uh, how uh, uh, an early stage um, uh, an early career stage musician can engage in greater community outreach. Uh, you mentioned um, the best way to, to learn is by doing. Uh, do you have uh, other advice about the way that folks who are, who are starting uh, to explore how to engage in community um, are, are able to do so? I think what's really important for, for any, anything actually, not just musicians, um, is this idea of wanting to explore, the idea of wanting to learn more. Um, and it's a very good starting point, I think. Um, every community is different. Um, every opportunity uh, is different. And I think one has to seek those. Um, I think it's very similar to when we're doing research. Um, mm -hmm. We have to seek for the information. Um, and we start with a question. 
um, which is how do we get engaged? And then we look for the answers mm -hmm. and we start to learn so much along the way and so much more. And so what we actually get is much more than just the answers to the questions. And um, I think for a young musician that would like to get more involved, first of all, you know, it's not just about music that's mm -hmm. going to help um, becoming involved in the community. Uh, a broader perspective of the world, um, the broader perspective of community, um, and also trying to see, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, one of the questions to ask um, is, what would I want? What would I want if I'm in the shoes of another person? Mm -hmm. And we have to think from the other side as well when we're engaged in community engagement. Yeah, we ask ourselves, what do, what do I want? What's needed? But the third question is, what would it be like to be on the other side, mm -hmm. to be in other person's shoes? And with these three questions, I think that one can start to formulate and really make it concrete what the idea is and to start getting really active. Right. Is, are, do you think there are, are good ways to um, solicit that type of perspective from the person that you're hoping to help or the community that you're hoping to help. Uh, I'm thinking about community engagement and, and what does that mean to put yourself in that perspective, but also to hear others' perspectives in how you shape your own work. Are there good ways to, to do that or ways that you found have been successful? I think it's always an exchange mm -hmm. and exchange and sharing. And it's not necessarily just immediately with music or with the arts, but it could be having, having a meal together or mm -hmm. just starting with a simple game um, in many different ways that we have to find this common ground together. Mm -hmm. And that's a shared work as well. Yeah. And also collaborate. If I'm, for example, then going to um, a community um, or a village or um in say a region in Southeast Asia, um, sometimes we're able to collaborate with local musicians who are already doing community mm -hmm. engagement work. Mm -hmm. We exchange our ideas. Of course, we often have very similar problems that we're encountering or problems that we're trying to solve. And together we also got, go out to the communities mm -hmm. and that kind of collaboration. So collaboration can happen, exchange can happen in many different levels in many different directions all at once. Right. And acknowledging that, um, looking for these opportunities and really trying to actually um, get everyone to participate, I think mm -hmm. is important. Uh, Midori, that uh, is uh, connected to one of the questions that one of our audience members posed, which was how you set up the exchanges with local communities or, or when you visit um, kind of more rural or uh, more um, distant villages, how, how was that set up logistically? So in many different ways, um, sometimes through uh, partnerships that are already there uh, from previous years and some NGOs uh, work not just in one country or one region, but they work in multiple areas. And so we have those partnerships already Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's actually just research from mm. ground, ground up. <laughs> mm -hmm. And thank goodness we have Google. We have different ways of doing research now. Um, also, um, I think being in a university community is always mm -hmm. wonderful. Uh, mm -hmm. You can go to different departments. Um, you can go to different um, um, areas of interest, uh, find different associations, student groups, uh, start there. Um, sometimes it's also um, working with some of our supporters and sometimes they also have contacts. Mm -hmm. And actually the world in that sense is so wonderfully connected. Great. Uh, I, I hear a clear theme about the importance of, of contacts and, and collaboration. Um, and that's also a theme that other audience members are, are asking about. And they're uh, asking how you um, are able to engage with your colleagues uh, as for Midori and friends, or um, who you're able to, to work with in all of these nonprofit endeavors. Um, have you got any 
stories or, or anecdotes that you might share about, uh, uh, about these collaborations or collaborators? Um, <laughs> stories, I'm not so sure. Um, <laughs> But no, I, I, you know, there are so many collaborations that I'm able to have. Um, and sometimes collaborations develop into friendships. Sometimes friendships actually then bring on collaborations. It, they work in both directions. Um, sometimes I ask colleagues that I'm performing with um, to support the cause by collaborating or coming to give a presentation. Sometimes I meet through um, my travels or my teaching. Um, a younger person, younger artist who's also very, very interested in getting to know more of the work we do. Um, just having gre great contacts, um, I think they really help in continuing these collaborations mm -hmm. and one thing will lead to another and it's ongoing mm -hmm. it's absolutely ongoing and you know actually many of my colleagues now have different organizations or different activities that they're passionate about and to be able to share in their interests and their mm -hmm. missions mm -hmm. um that's a collaboration that could also develop into something much more later yeah how do you maintain long-term connections or main, maintaining touch with all the many people that you've worked with or, or even with friends and family? I think it depends on the person. Mm. Um, some people are very comfortable with Zoom. Um, some are more comfortable with um, Skype. Some are just phone calls. Some mm -hmm. just um, greetings once a year, um, mm -hmm. at least um, mm -hmm. over over the holidays, um, and sometimes just hearing through other friends. But actually, as a performer, this is an interesting thing. It's a trait that I see in my performing uh, colleagues as well, that uh, we travel so much. And mm -hmm. over time, we actually find friends or we create friendships in different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And that of course, you know, whenever we travel, we connect with them. Mm -hmm. But then there are all the times during the pandemic, of course, we didn't travel, so we didn't connect. Mm -hmm. um, and there are occasional messages, emails or letters or phone calls or texts or whatever it is, uh, just checking in on each other. But, you know, we accept the fact that these meetings don't always happen on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. But then when we are able to meet, it's very precious. It's mm -hmm. very important. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, um, do you what, what do you look forward to when we can hopefully return to, to greater normalcy out of this pandemic in terms of connecting with folks again or, or visiting certain parts of the country or the world? What do you look forward to it's most? It's going to be very, very interesting. Of course, we are starting to travel. We are starting to tour, I would say, about maybe two thirds of the touring is now back. We hope that it's going to keep moving in that direction. Um, I think that some things have changed so much and I think we all have to learn to embrace technology. Um, and for me, actually, there's nothing that replaces the live experience. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think technology is important because the technology can help actually making the direct live contacts more meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, so much of the preparatory work, for example, can be done over technology, over Skype or Zoom or whatever it is that we have. And I think we can learn to embrace, to um, use them effectively so mm -hmm. that we can make the live contact, the live experience much more meaningful. Mm, great. Thank you, Midori. I have two additional questions from um, audience members. One is asking about how you find time to de-stress away from arts and service. And another question um, returns us to leadership and if there are leaders that you find particularly inspiring. So maybe if you'd like to address um, what th those questions in order, or um, you can pick which question that you uh, would like to, to say more about. Mm, okay, well, there are many different ways that, that I just de-stress. Um, of course, during the pandemic, I learned so much about how to Zoom and how to do research on the internet. And um, 
I started to gather a lot of information about, yeah, possibly going to different hot bath uh, in Japan when mm-hmm. all this is done. I would love to go to Japan. I haven't been able to go for so long now. Um, the border is pretty much closed for us at the moment. Um, and this is a country, of course, I was born there, but mm-hmm. I went there on such regular basis. And now I haven't been able to go. It would be pretty close to three years, I think, mm. if I'm able to go next June. Um, right. So yeah, so I've been doing some research on hot bath. Um, <laughs> I've been, yeah, and I've been looking at um, pictures of um, uh, the puppy bowl. Uh, mm. I don't know if you, any of you know about puppy bowl. It's not the Super Bowl, but it's a puppy bowl. <laughs> and um, <laughs> And it's really very, very cute. And it's a big, it's a very um, big adoption. Uh, mm. Yeah. Um, it's a workshop and I, well, it's not a workshop, but it's a drive and it's, it's a lot of, a lot of cute, cute, cute dogs. And, um, <laughs> so I've been looking at a lot of those. Um, yeah, just, I just stress um, that way. And I read uh, recently, I, got something that um, it's an apparatus that allows me to read while uh, lying down without having mm-hmm. to hold the book. So mm-hmm. I love that. Mm-hmm. Um, I do love to read. So um, yeah, that's, that's been, yeah, I cook. Um, I dream about, yeah, cooking <laughs> up some great recipes. Uh, in the end, you know, there's more going on in my thoughts and sort of, yeah, inspirations mm-hmm. rather than in the actual um, kitchen, but. What, what do you enjoy then, cooking, Midori? Um, just whatever tastes good. <laughs> um, and um, I like to actually try different things. And I, through my travels, of course, I was able to try so many different things. And of course it gives me a lot of different ideas. <laughs> so mm. I love it. Really? Yeah. Uh, and, and Midori, the, the second question about. Um, yeah, but the, leadership yeah yeah the leadership um there's so many people that i respect um recently i've been thinking again so much about isaac stern Mm. and um, he was one of my mentors of course and he had a great influence on me uh, for many different reasons um becoming involved in community becoming mm-hmm. an activist um, to live your passions. Um, and of course, as an artist, and I mean, there's, you know, of course, no questions asked about that. But um, I think for me, he, yeah, it was a wonderful relationship. I mm-hmm. learned so much from him. And I remember also these arguments that we, we used to argue so much with each other mm-hmm. on, Whatever, whether it's a musical issue. And in that arguing process, I learned so much to defend myself and that made me own mm. my idea. That meant that I really, really needed to know my stuff. And mm. it made me want to learn even more. And that was really important. It's not just, yeah, play so that it feels good or it sounds good or it's more convenient or it's, it just feels right. But mm-hmm. um, really finding a way to own my ideas um Hmm. this is as an interpreter this is extremely important Mm -hmm. um and to be responsible to become responsible first as a musician as an interpreter and also as a person Hmm. Uh, maybe midori can you share a little bit more kind of as we're wrapping up about this sense of responsibility uh, and how that might be related to um, one's responsibility to one's community, to service um, and to leadership. Uh, What do you look forward to in how music can, you said it it can't change the world, but it can make it a better place. Is there a parting thought that we can kind of wrap all of these ideas together in, in one way or in a couple ways? Mm. Well, I think it's such a, a large, big question you're asking here, mm-hmm. and it's not so simple. But I think one of the ways um, that one becomes responsible, what it means to be res- responsible, I think, is to recognize that um, we're not perfect, that mm. um, 
we are, we're human, we make mistakes, um, we can't solve everything, mm -hmm. we are not invincible. Um, and I think that is a very important responsibility that we all need to learn. And right. I think in the pandemic, during the pandemic, we st started to be reminded of this again, to a certain mm. extent. Mm -hmm. um, but I think responsibility is not about just saying that we can do it all and just by doing, but it's a recognition that we're not perfect, that we're not mm. able to do it. But therefore we thrive to be able to become better and to still find ways to be able to do what would bring us to a better place. Right. So, um, yeah, it's not just doing, but it's the thought. It's, mm -hmm. it's not just the physical actions, but it's also the thought process. It's a state of mind. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you for that really lovely uh, uh, parting thought. Um, I wish that we could talk for another hour or so, but um, I know that it's also quite late in Hanover and we're just grateful for uh, your participation in this uh, discussion as well as your performance and your, your presentation. So thank you very, very much, Midori. Thank you very much. Great, so I believe it's my responsibility to say that the program is now concluded. Uh, the recording of this will be posted on the Radcliffe website in a few days. If you'd like any more information about upcoming programs or access to recordings from prior events, then you can visit www.radcliffe.harvard.edu. Thank you for joining us and please everyone take care of yourselves.